Chi. Hey family, what's up guys? Uh, another Q&A workout vlog. Today is a back workout. Well, not today. This was a few days ago. Back workout. Before I get into answering questions, um, hmm, I'd like you guys to notice uh, I'm trying out two different stances. On my left side, when I'm doing my left arm, I'm trying out a stance I don't normally do. Staggered stance of dumbbell row. And then when I'm doing my right side, I'm, I'm doing my regular stance, which is uh, kind of hips um, side by side and feet uh, basically parallel. Um, and look at that nasty, vicious looking lower back. Ugh, it just looks like I'm hurting. It looks horrible. And I think it's uh, partly uh, made even worse just because I have a hamstring issue going on right now. But now I want you to take a look at my right side. It looks nothing like when I'm doing my left side simply because of my uh, my feet kind of or my hips aligned feet parallel um, and not staggered so just totally look at that difference in back position it just looks so much safer um, totally much more safe so yeah that's just a quick observation and uh, another reason why I don't really do staggered stance though this particular day I tried out um, doing these dumbbell rows on the bench and I rarely ever do that so something kind of new I wanted to try that out and see how that felt so I'm gonna blast into some of these questions guys um, I'm not gonna do a timestamp simply because there's a lot of questions here and I like to help out as much of you guys as possible and uh, it's gonna get a little crazy for timestamping so first question is will you ever do a collab with Frank Yang probably someday next question from Danny do you believe using a belt takes away from working out your core um, when it comes to belts, I'm kind of in the middle area. I do see a lot of people buying or using belts when they really don't need them. Uh, like doing, I don't know, bicep curls and tricep pushdowns. And that would be hella embarrassing if I had videos of me doing curls with a belt or pushdowns with a belt. But, um, I do find them useful when you're doing really heavy squats, deadlifts, especially those deadlifts kind of as a uh, insurance um, kind of like insurance when you're doing those deadlifts but uh, especially those deadlifts uh, I it does it definitely does not take away from using your core because you you can't take away your core involvement even when you're using a belt you could have a belt that's like two feet two feet um, wide and it still wouldn't take away your core involvement um, it just can't it won't so that's not really something to worry about and even if it did take away your core involvement in terms of I don't know maybe ab development some people that, that's usually the issue what people have is they're afraid that by using a belt they won't be um, activating their abs and they won't be able to I don't know properly hit them or build them or something when they're doing their, their main lifts but uh, even if that was the case it's like you're most likely adding a little bit of direct ab work anyway so I don't really see it as that big of an issue. If you do think it's an issue with working your core, then go ahead and work your core uh, directly with ab work. Um, and if you don't really worry about it working or taking away from working your core, then it's not an issue for you either. So uh, my, my recommendation is uh, save it for your heavier deadlifts and squats, maybe something like an overhead press, OHP. But generally, you know, not until you're at, I don't know, maybe 80, 85, or 90 percent uh, one rep max kind of weight. Next, Brando wants to know, how do I bulk? Is it just adding calories or do I need to count macros? Bulking is simply a term used uh, signifying a caloric surplus, meaning you're taking in more calories than you're burning. It doesn't require you to actually count calories, know your calorie intake, or know your macronutrient intake, which is just a specific um, specific way of counting your calories. Uh, just a more um, pinpoint uh, way of counting calories. Uh, you don't actually have to count calories to be in a caloric surplus. Um, though counting your calories, counting, tracking your macros will enable you to um, pinpoint the rate of fat gain or fat loss uh, when it comes to your when it comes to your body composition so to totally control your bulk to control your fat and muscle gain um, that's where 
counting calories and macros can be useful, Brando. Next question, Matthias. Um, currently, he's using the PHAT routine, which is uh, pretty much Lane Norton's power hypertrophy adaptive, adaptive routine. Um, how can I use the RPE method in this program? Quick uh, rundown of the RPE method. Um, I don't even know if that's the real name, um, but the way I use it and the way um, a lot of people tend to use it, I'll explain it, is, is that uh, it's generally saved for the compound movements, especially like deadlift, squat, bench. Um, the way I use it is just perhaps one way of using it. A lot of workout routines are actually based on RPE. But anyways, my uh, the way I use it is uh, when I'm doing my deadlift, squat, bench, or, or other um, compound movement, and I don't use it for every movement, just specific ones, especially the most compound of compounds. Um, for example, I'm doing squats. I will pick a weight and I guess there's two different ways you can go about this. You can pick a weight and then aim for a rep range where you will hit a specific RPE or you can pick a weight and aim for an RPE and that brings you to a certain amount of reps. So basically, the rate of perceived exertion scale goes from 1 to 10, or another scale is 1 to 20. And the higher you go up means um, how hard you're pushing yourself in that given set. So basically, an RPE of 10, we'll use the 1 to 10 scale, that if you hit an RPE 10, that means whatever rep range you hit, say it was 5 reps at an RPE 10, that means that, um, th that those 200 pound squats for a set of five at RPE 10 means you could not have done any more weight or any more reps. Not like nothing, nothing more. If it was say an RPE 9.5 of 200 pound squats at uh, five reps, an RPE 9 basically means that um, you could have only done maybe just a little bit more weight, just maybe five pounds or something like that. Um, now an RPE nine means you could have done one more rep and just one more rep. And obviously it could also mean more weight, but basically at the weight you were using, you had one more rep. Um, RPE 8.5 could pretty much mean um, one more rep and more weight or possibly two more reps like really like two hard ass reps uh, the last rep would be would be a killer and it would put you at a, at a 10 um, so that basically that's the way I utilize it and how I, I gauge my training in sort of this regulation this auto regulation style is that uh, say I'm hitting my squats the way I like to do it is aim towards a rep range with a given weight. So I'll take the weight that I used the prior week and generally my, all my squats right now are in the three to five rep range. So I'll take that 500 pounds or 400 pounds, wherever it may be, and aim towards the three to five rep range and whatever it happens to land myself on at a RPE 9, that's what I hit. So I aim towards three to five reps at whatever pounds it may be. So let's just say three something realistically like 390 for three to five reps actually I did that a couple I did that yesterday um, I was going for three to five reps and I hit RPE 9 which means I only had one left in the tank at that fifth rep so I hit that fifth rep and I called that a set I could have hit one more it would have been a grinder um, and it would have been the end like that I could have not have done any more than just one more rep so that's how I kind of judged it was RPE 9 it's something that becomes intuitive. It's not something that you can just be like, oh, yeah, that, boom, that was easy. That was RP9. It's something you um, have to work and get used to kind of learning your body sort of thing. So what I do then is I drop the weight um, five, basically somewhere between five and 10 percent. And I, I also do some more auto regulation at that point. I, I think to myself, like. How close to RP9 was that? Was that a little bit more or a little bit less? And uh, if I feel like you know I hit that set uh, and it was really, really easy, I might drop the weight 
Uh, if it was like eh, somewhere in the middle, I might drop at seven percent or seven and a half. And then uh, if I feel like a set totally annihilated the shit out of me, what I'll do is I will uh, drop that, uh, drop the weight of that exercise by 10%. If if I feel like holy shit, that RP9, even I, even though it was RP9 or or perhaps I accidentally overshot and I and I end up hitting an R, uh, RPE 9.5 or 10, whatever it may be, I'll end up dropping the weight 10%. So. Um, my 500 pound squat for example is now 450 pounds uh after i accidentally hit rp10 or um had a had a had a rough time or just wasn't feeling too good even at that rp9 um so from there i basically do as many sets of the same reps um until i hit that rp9 again until i feel like oh shit that set left me with one with just one left in the tank or you know, if I end up hitting RP10 on accident or whatever it may be, I'll just call it right then and there. Like, okay, I'm done with this exercise. And the cool thing is, some days you might do one back offset. So you'll hit, you know, your 500 pound squat. Um, maybe drop it seven percent. So you drop it uh, 25 pounds or whatever. Is that right? 25 pounds? Shit. <laughs> I gotta do some math here. Anyways, you, you get what I'm saying. You, you drop it about seven percent. And then, wait, that 5% would be 25 pounds, excuse me. So, so between 25 and 50, um, about 37.5. So you drop at 37.5 pounds, and then you hit as many sets as you can in the same rep range until you hit that RPE 9. So that's kind of how I use it. Uh, and, dude, you could use it for whatever you like, anything. Um, you could do it for barbell curls, tricep pushdowns. I've done it for every exercise practically. But I've gone into I, I've that's where preference comes in, and I've realized that I've, I'm only using it on uh, on certain exercises. Like some exercises, I'm starting to just be like, okay, I, I I'd rather just keep it the same. While other exercises, I do like to utilize that whole uh, system of audio regulation. The ones that I do like to use the RPE scale or the RP system are like deadlift, squat, bench, uh, overhead press. Um, incline bench press, uh, flat bench press, uh, I'm sorry, flat dumbbell bench press. And for example, some of the things that are, I mean, even barbell curls, I like to do the RP thing. Now, some exercises don't really, I don't really find it too necessary for me personally, such as um, my calves. I like to just keep the sets all the same on my calves um, and, and a few other exercises, a few other muscle groups. But you can see how you there's no rules like you could do that RPE scale RPE system on the exercises you'd like, and just like there's so many different ways to uh, to uh, progress um, a rep here, a little bit of pounds there. There's just tons of different ways you can train, and uh, that's how you can use the RPE system in your PHA routine. Pretty much wherever you'd like on the exercises you like. Next question. I hope I hope I hope I didn't lose any of you guys on the last one. That might have been a confusing topic for some of the beginners out there. And if it was, and you still don't, you know, it's kind of like confusing you. First off, my apologies. Second, uh, you might want to just Google RPE scale uh, powerlifting or RPE scale whatever, and then uh, hopefully some of the articles you'll find might uh, might make help it make more sense to you. Um, here we go. Here's a cool question from TC. He wants to know what exercises I recommend for someone with sloping shoulders. Um, I'm guessing uh, douchebag shoulders or uh, shoulders that kind of roll forward. Um, some of the some of the things I recommend for that are, are uh, one kind of walking with just better posture, so not allowing your shoulders to round forward, especially when at your computer desk, not being hunched forward. Um, kind of standing. Uh, or keeping your shoulders um, neutral and your back um, nice and straight. That's one thing to start off with. And uh, making sure that when you, for example, bench press, you're keeping those shoulders back and pinned and traps in the bench. Um, I like doing face pulls to help me round out my shoulders and, and uh, counteract all of the bench pressing that I do. As well as just doing lots of pulls, uh, pulling movements for my back in general. 
and also hitting my rear delts so um, rear delt uh, specific uh, exercise isolation exercises so good posture um, good form on pressing movements um, plenty of face pulls um, also mobility work for my shoulders and um, lots of pulling in general um, pretty much the same or greater pulling than uh, pushing and I hope that helps um, Craig wants to know what kind of cardio I prefer and why uh, high intensity or steady state <clears throat> um, when it comes to like how if like, um, what's the right word uh, whichever is more effective um, definitely the high intensity intervals are going to be more effective no matter what when it comes to fat loss um, now when it comes to your training protocol and maintaining your strength um, that's where high intensity kind of can perhaps hurt your training because it uses up a lot of uh, your reserve system in terms of your central nervous system so where you have to find a good balance point when it comes to implementing high intensity training with your regular training because uh, it could take a little bit of recovery that may that you would may have wanted for for example deadlift squats and so on so the next time you train you might not be as recovered compared to if you were to do uh, steady state cardio but then again you have that uh, that higher fat loss effect from the high intensity so it's kind of a give and take you have to find out which one um, or find out the combinations of, of either or or both that you find doable um, and that works best for your schedule your preference and where you're at in your fat loss phase um, or you know if you just want to do cardio for the shits and gigs just throw in some high intensity in there for uh, you know increased um, capacity increased workload capacity that's what I recommend um, Sunny wants to know why I keep my carbs at uh, 450 on my refeed when I have my rest days or my regular days at 375 and let me get a drink of water real quick so my, my, my macros for carbs, yeah, they're at 375 for six days of the week. And then one day of the week, it's at 450. A um, couple different reasons. Basically, that, that was the same refeed that I had when I was cutting. And I guess um, we, it's like, why have a refeed when you're at a surplus? And actually, there's a few different reasons. And mine's mo more so just to have that day where... where um, it's just like that day of the week you look forward to <laughs> in a way it's kind of psychological um, but also planned correctly it can uh, definitely help give you an extra boost for that, that specific workout of the day or perhaps the next day depending on when you get most of those calories in and uh, when you like to train and for me it's kind of a ending point or a, a goal point for me to raise my carbs to I like to get my carbs up to 450. Uh, basically, that's where they were before I started cutting. Um, so I'm slowly working my way up to that point. And at the same time, uh, having those 450 carbs as a reef eat day, assuming that you know I'm hitting the rest of the macros perfectly, kind of gives that um, kind of gives that that assurance that I'm at a surplus as well because with my metabolism constantly increasing from just getting off of my cutting diet um having that 450 it's kind of like this okay i'm gonna be at a surplus in the grand scheme of this week and i must admit though that since i'm pretty loosey-goosey with this off season and uh i'll eat out maybe i guess it depends some weeks it's once, twice, maybe three times. Um, no matter what, I'm pretty much at a surplus at this point. But on those weeks that I'm hitting macros, say, perfectly, that 450 helps give me that extra boost. Uh, that mental um, – one helps me have that mental satisfaction for hitting the macros perfectly for the week. Um, kind of gives me more room for when I do, when I do eat out. Um, on say a Saturday or Sunday with family members, um, 
extra boost for the workout that I may have that day or the day after, and uh, kind of gives me just gives me something different in the grand scheme of the macros. And also, like I said, keeps helps make make sure that I'm at that surplus, since like I said, the metabolism is constant. It's increasing and increasing. And last but not least, actually hitting that 450 uh, refeed. Um, as opposed to say having like a crazy dirty bowl or cheat day cheat meal kind of thing actually hitting a, a accurate 450 carb um, also helps increase uh, slowly um, my metabolic capacity so it works it helps me work my total calories by having that one day of the week at a uh, really really fine-tuned 450 carb uh, that's if I had that 450 carb because uh, kind of uh, kind of laid back uh when it comes to off season um so i'm not 100 percent on my macros i will admit but uh in the grand scheme of things i'm doing pretty damn good i'm proud of myself and uh overall not looking bad um standing now between 168 and 170 which in terms of average weigh-ins i'm about six to seven pounds above stage weight about nine weeks post show so doing pretty good, finding a good middle ground when it comes to my, my nutrition. Equip me a little bitch! Oh, his cake!